Welcome everyone back to the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel. What a joy it is to have you with us if you're rejoining us. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time, can I just let you know, as I often do, we are the UK's largest pro-marriage organisation. Uh, we represent individuals and groups who s uh, stand for this unique thing of one man, one woman marriage. And that's becoming more rare in society, but we would like to make it less so and much more popular. And that's because we think one man, one woman marriage is special, it's unique. It brings uh, benefits which are demonstrated through the literature, through research, across cultures, across time, that no other relationship brings. And that's why it's so special and so fundamental to stable society. And that's why we're talking about it. And that doesn't mean other things don't exist. Of course, they do in a liberal democracy. And those things are for liberal democracies to have conversations about. But marriage is completely separate and completely unique. And we're going to be talking about a book today. Uh, a book by Louise Perry, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, a, a fundamental book, I think, uh, for today's culture and a book that a lot of people should read and we're going to be analysing it. Now, I'm not talking to Louise today and it'll become uh, uh, evident why I haven't approached Louise for a discussion, but I've approached somebody who is an absolute superstar, somebody who many of you will know because uh, she formed the basis of the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel and everything that we, we've built on. I've only come around recently, but she was there right at the beginning, Dr. Sharon James. Can we start off, Sharon, would you say hello to our listeners? Lovely to be with you today. Oh, right, Sharon, it's a real joy. And I wonder, before we talk about this book, which is a very, very important book. I wonder, can we just reflect for a couple of minutes on uh, those days back in 2012, 2013, 14, uh, when you came along and uh, you, you basically led the Coalition for Marriage and its efforts and its videos and everything else like that for a couple of years. Tell us about those days. What were they like? Well, first off, I didn't lead the Coalition for Marriage, Tony, um, but I was their media spokesperson and I found that a huge privilege. Um, and as I reflect on those days, I think the thing that we often forget is that hardly anyone was asking for so-called gay marriage. It wasn't a big issue. None of the election mandates said it, it just wasn't it wasn't in demand. And David Cameron certainly didn't have it in his election mandate. He hadn't got it in his manifesto. I think three days before the election, he had said I had he had no plans to redefine marriage. So this kind of came from nowhere. And on reflection, I think it was a very elite, um, what many people would say, London metropolitan view that was then imposed on the rest of the country. And at the beginning of the campaign, we did polling to show that majority opinion was not in favor of um, so-called gay marriage. And then the really interesting thing was the way that the media pushed the whole thing by the time that it was, in my view, bulldozed through, uh, I won't even go into the outrage of the cons uh, consultation and how that was uh, gerrymandered. But anyway, move on. Afterwards, it was as if there was a sudden flick of the switch and people who had previously had either no interest or opposed it. I mean, Stonewall wasn't um, endorsing the same sex marriage until 2010 suddenly reinvented history and made out as if anyone ever who had said that marriage is only between a man and a woman was somehow bigoted and a dinosaur and to be relegated to the ancient history books. So there was an extremely sudden shift and it was very strange, almost weird, surreal uh, to be caught in the middle of that and to be speaking to people from the beginning of the campaign to the end who were who are moving, a work in progress, and then wanting to forget their previous selves. That was interesting. But then also the other thing I'd reflect, Tony, is that at the time, during the campaign, those of us who were speaking for man, woman, marriage, real marriage, were saying, if you attempt to redefine this institution, which has been around since the beginning of time and across cultures and across societies, what right have you got anyway to do that? Because it's not a man-made legal made institution it's pre-political if you try to do this there are going to be certain consequences and we named a whole series of consequences including the minute the ink is drying you will be telling children in schools that there are no essential differences between the sexes and effectively they can choose what gender they want. oh people said that will never happen no conspiracy no, no. theory absolutely said, yeah of course you will begin to get documentation changes where you can't even say a man a husband, a wife, a mother, a father anymore. That will be seen to be 
heteronormative. Oh, no, 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 that will never happen. So we, we warned of consequences to free speech. Oh, no, 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 you're scaremongering, you're scaremongering. And sure as day, day, day is day, again, as soon as it had happened, those various consequences came to be. Now, that's not a happy thing to reflect on, but I think it's important in the interests of the record uh, to say that, that that's that's what happened. And I, I think that those are the sort of memories that stick out for me. But I also just remember the encouragement of so many people on the street, ordinary people saying, we actually do believe in marriage, but we're scared to say so. And what you're doing at Coalition for Marriage is just giving us some arguments, giving us some messages to be able to express what we what we really believe. And I think, Tony, as you do, that in their hearts, many people still do fundamentally believe that there is something special about man-woman marriage. But tragically, increasingly, many people are afraid to say so. And that's why the work that you're doing with the Coalition for Marriage is so very, very important. Well, it's very good of you to say so. I mean, and again, in fact, um, Louise Perry, who we're going to talk about, you know, she concludes with the 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 thought of promoting marriage for women and saying actually the best thing a woman can do, and this is coming from a dedicated um, feminist, if you like, who's supported in, in, the, in the foreword to her book by many other very popular feminists. Uh, she says the best thing for women is to get married and to stay married uh, because it's a, a wonderful institution, and, and we'll come on to that. But um, just to pick up on a couple of those things you say, because they are important. Nobody's saying that um, uh, other, other couples in society shouldn't have the, the rights they, they deserve or the rights they need, and, and nobody should face uh, prejudice or, or any kind of harassment for wanting to live the lives they live. That, that's a whole other conversation. And we won't touch on the, the schools and the children and the influence there, because that's maybe a separate thing. But, um, you know, people living the life they want to live in a liberal democracy, that's the point of a liberal democracy, is to stop people interfering with their freedoms. But marriage describes the thing that only one man and one woman can do. It's all about raising the best version of the next generation. And, you know, the biological connection we know from the literature is absolutely vital. In fact, Louise, in her book, um, refers to t statistics that indicate children born outside of all or raised apart from their biological mum and dad are uh, up to 100 times more likely to be harmed than those raised with biological parents. Now that doesn't for a minute mean that every biological parent is good and every non-biological parent is bad, absolutely not. But on a population basis, these things matter. And the problem is, we know with things like seatbelts, we know with things like smoking, that government messages, media messages, influence people's behavior. And we know that the marriage rate is falling, but it's not falling among the, the wealthy liberal elites who are spouting this stuff. It's falling among those less well-off uh, people in society who could do with the benefits that marriage brings. And they're not getting it because they're listening to the rhetoric. And that's the real disaster that we're facing here. Indeed, I think that um Another current thinker, Rob Henderson, describes luxury beliefs that are promoted by the intellectual elites who have all the resources available to them to shield themselves from the fallout. And I found it absolutely enraging during the uh, Coalition for Marriage campaign that politicians who often had stable marriages themselves were effectively taking another sledgehammer to the institution of marriage, which already had been made so difficult for people in the lower income uh, levels. And I think that perhaps one of the weaknesses of, of Louise Perry's books, and there are many strengths, and, and we'll come on to those, is that uh, she doesn't necessarily go into all of the disincentives to marriage that successive governments have put into place. And I know that um, you've interviewed Patricia Morgan, who documented that stunningly successfully. Um, over decades, the governments uh, of whatever political party we're making it almost impossible for people below a certain income level uh, to get married because benefits are calculated on a household basis. And that immediately makes marriage a non-rational choice for anybody under a fairly high income level, which is utterly tragic. And the politicians who drive these changes are shielded from their consequences. So that's, that, that's, that's one point. And then another point you made, which Louise Perry does make very effectively, and that is that we have to look at policy on population levels. And the ridiculous thing is when people come with individual anecdotes and then want a policy that will suit absolutely every individual case and they remove all the guardrails because one person might bump up against them and get hurt but then on a population level 
so many more people end up getting hurt when you remove those um, structures and those guardrails. I remember being, uh, well, I, I, just just the uh, contradictions and the problems with Anthony Giddens' uh, seminal book, The Transformation of Intimacy, 1992. He gives the anecdote of an aunt who was trapped in a loveless marriage. And well, yes, there were people, there were individuals who weren't always flourishing to their best life within a society where marriage was the norm. But on the other hand, Louise Perry says, look at the population level, at the protections that stable marriages gave to so many children. And if you look at the sum total of suffering, um, when you remove all of those uh, structures of marriage, there's going to be a greater sum total of suffering uh, when, it, when you smash it all down. But people like uh, Anthony Giddens seem to want to smash all of those structures down and have this pure relationship where there's no obligation on either side. And he confessed, well, there'll be endemic insecurity, but that's the price worth paying for complete freedom. And I thought, no, it's not. Complete freedom is going to lead to far more suffering. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the government, the government has no problem with promoting things that bring about the best results for the largest amount of people Not in other areas, areas of life. Exactly. So obesity, for example, you know, everyone knows, well, actually, it's not a great way to live. It's, it's high health risk, all those sorts of things. It costs the NHS a lot. So we're going to try and encourage people to tackle that in, in ways that they can. Yet when it comes to marriage, well, actually, the thing that's uniquely great for everyone will not promote uh, and the other things that actually have an awful lot of harm and risk associated with them, we will shout from the rooftops. Uh, you know, it's a funny old world. It's really strange, isn't it? I mean, yeah, absolutely. There are age limits on buying alcohol, on, on buying glue, on buying all sorts of things. And yet condoms are shoved at 12, 13 year olds as if there are no risks involved with sex. And I think it's this fear of being moralistic, this terror of, 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 of imposing any form of moral norms. And since the 1960s, it's as if the elites have been running at a rate of a thousand miles an hour from anything that could be construed as traditional morality. Um, so yeah, health's become the new, the new morality. We all have to be healthy, don't we, Tony? We're <laughs> trying my best, trying my best. We're all trying um, our best. <laughs> yeah, let, let's, let's get on to uh, Louise Perry's book. Now, um, wonderful book. Um, I would recommend people uh, read it. Now, she is uh, a person who writes for the New Statesman. Uh, she's about 30 years old, I think, and she's married with a, uh, a, a, a relatively newborn child herself. So that's that's kind of her background. I think this is her first book, and you may have read her stuff in The New Statesman. Uh, and she is an up-and-coming journalist, uh, independent journalist, but doing very well. And this book is uh, quite brown, groundbreaking. Uh, and it really deals, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Shan, it deals with uh, the prevailing hookup culture uh, among uh, youth, teenagers these days. And I think we had David Payton, uh, Professor Payton, who's a, uh, an economist, talking to us recently about, you know, more sex education, strangely enough, is leading to more sex. Who'd have thought? But um, that's what's happening. That's what's happening. And we've got this hookup culture, which, again, comes back to the, the, the feminist notion uh, that women should disassociate themselves emotionally with the sex act, just like men do, and behave like men. And I believe Louise's fundamental point is actually women don't want that. They can't handle it. They don't need it. They don't like it. And the only people who are winning in this conversation are men. Have I, have I got that summary right? Well, I think that's, 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 that's very fair, Tony. I think that she outlines the catastrophic effects of radical feminism, which essentially argued that equality must mean sameness. Now that's obviously simplifying it because there were feminists who said, oh no, there are differences. Women are the first sex, we're the better sex. Uh, but, but put simply, um, uh, second wave, radical feminism, gender feminism, many, many took from that, that any talk about differences between the sexes must be sexist. You weren't allowed to do that. Um, and that ended up actually disrespecting, I believe both men and women, because you're not respecting the fact that while there is absolute equality of humanity and equality of dignity and equality of worth, there are also significant differences between the sexes, surprise, surprise. And Louise Perry is saying, wake up, there are differences. And she explains very clearly that part of the reason young people have been able to be sold this lie that there are no differences is because we are in an industrial, an advanced industrial society where the obvious 
capacity for men for much tougher, harder, more dangerous work because men are stronger than women. That is somewhat masked by the fact that many people aren't engaged in manual labour or all of those sort of spheres, agricultural labour or whatever, where men's strength is obvious and apparent. It's easier to con yourself that we're the same uh, when you're behind a desk. That's right. When, you, when you're sat on Zoom using a laptop, actually, there might not be a lot of difference between man and woman. But you're right. She says, uh, I get confused between what I've read in the book and what I've heard on her interviews talking about the book. But she says you only need to spend half an hour in a gym to recognise that men are fundamentally different to women. She does. And she gives some really telling examples. For example, a few years back, the national American women's football team was beaten by the Dallas under 15s. <laughs> you know, and, and it's just so obvious. And I think that, to be fair, Tony, and she says this too, a lot of people have said the things that she has been saying over the last 30, 40 years, as we have seen the catastrophic effects of the sexual revolution and the catastrophic effects of radical feminism. But they've generally been people of an older generation, more socially conservative, some of them, not all of them, by any means Christian. I mean, I think of people who've done a brilliant critique, such as Melanie Phillips and Catherine Hackim, um, many others. But she's coming at it from the perspective of a, of, a, of a young woman and somebody more from the political left. And she writes in a way that I hope will have traction with younger people and help them to see they do not have to be trapped in this loveless, um, commitment-free zone where everyone's expected to enjoy casual sex because frankly it's dehumanizing it's degrading it's bad for everyone it's bad for women it's also bad for men shocking for children because children do result from sex and she she, she describes those things in a way that does not come over as uh, judgmental or uh, alarming to young people so they probably will read her book whereas they might not have read uh, the many other books and critiques that have come out over the past 30, 40 years. Mm. And so you mentioned there, children do result from sex, that the numbers of abortions are increasing, not decreasing, you know, even though we've got, you know, a, a freely available um, contraception, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, but abortions are going out. So children do result from sex. Children do result from sex. The point is that no contraception is, is, is 100%. Mm. And when you, again, take that to population level, you will get as soon as you get sexual freedom, you will get many, many, many more unplanned pregnancies. And yeah. that's been the result from the 1960s. Yeah. And then there's the tragedy of abortion. Now, I personally mm. believe that abortion is taking of an innocent human life. Yeah. Um, Louise Perry admits that it is terrible for the women. So she kind of sticks at the harm to the women. And that in itself is sufficient reason to oppose it. There's catastrophic harm to women. And that's well documented in... Um, Ryan Anderson's latest book, um, very clear damage to women. But anyway, there are there are the abortions, which, but there are also many children born outside of stable, committed, married relationships. And Louise Perry is very clear about the advantages to children to being born in a stable marriage. Now she says, again, on an individual level, there will always be exceptions, and you know and I know, single mothers are doing a fantastic job, single fathers are doing a fantastic job. But on a population level, the married home is the safest place for a child to be brought up. And a situation with a transient boyfriend or a step parent or whatever is statistically the most, a very unsafe place for children to be brought up. And she gives all of that um, in a way that I think is just based on the evidence. It's, it's what's there. And anyone who cares about social justice should be concerned about those things. And she makes that point very clearly. Yeah, and it's not marginal. I mean, that there are significant differences. There are much better outcomes overall for kids who grow up with a biological mum and dad. And it, it's not even close. It's, it's a long way apart from anything else. She also goes on, there's the, there's the damage to children who are born outside of um, committed marriage relationships, but there's also societal damage. And that's a very interesting point because actually if you factor out the fatherless young men who end up committing crime and then incarcerated and then reoffending. It is absolute tragedy for those young men. I mean, I can't, I can't speak too strongly about the, the, the bad start they've had and how it's almost been as if they've been 
I do believe in individual responsibility, but they have had a very, very rough start. And then it's trajectory downwards. And that has horrible impacts on society as well and a cost to society. So, and, the, and the girls without fathers who statistically yeah. become sexually yeah. active and pregnant Absolutely. a lot earlier in their teens. Absolutely. And the cycle then goes on and on and yeah. on and on. Yeah, in fact, something that could have perhaps been made a little bit more of in the book um, is the whole Rotherham scenario. You know, and, and you know, our friend Norman, our late friend Norman Wells uh, depicted that so powerfully in his book, Unprotected. This whole thing where generations of young girls were let down because it was falsely thought that they were giving consent to this unspeakable abuse because these poor young girls, vulnerable, fatherless, many of them, many of them in care, um, were offered bribes and incentives from predatory men. And because they said yes to those material bribes, social workers and police shut their eyes to the abuse and said, oh, they're saying yes, they're consenting because they're saying yes to the gifts. And you think, this is just an unspeakable outrage. And I think that uh, Louise Perry gives a marvelous description of the brilliant work that Josephine Butler did in rescuing prostitutes. Um, and she did do a great work. And uh, Louise Perry does a fantastic description of her work over in India, not personally going over there, but campaigning on behalf of Indian women who are being kidnapped by the British Army to provide for the brothels for the British Army. So she describes all that really well. What she could have said um, with as much effect actually was that Josephine Butler pioneered the raising of the age of consent to 16, which was of great protection. And now we've got a situation where that is not enforced and where children in school are effectively told in many sex heads lessons it won't be enforced if you have sex and, and you think not only that but parts of the uk sad. pushing to reduce it again yes, indeed down to 13 indeed. Well, and who knows it where was, it'll end if, it was, if, yeah. if the societal norm was to mm. enforce that it would be a protection of youngsters it's not a you know liberals might say oh, it's a dreadful curtailment of the freedom of children to have sex and i i don't think children should be free to have sex because they are too young for any form of meaningful understanding, engagement or consent in what they're doing. Now, consent is an issue she raises. We'll, we'll, we'll jump about the book a bit, but we'll try and follow our conversation as it leads. But she does raise the issue of consent and she says, look, just talking about consent with kids isn't good enough. That's not enough. So why does she make that point? Because children don't have the uh, capacity to understand uh, emotionally what is going on or physically what is going on. I mean, in my view, uh, until puberty, there is natural innocence and that should be protected. And giving children too much sexual information, I regard as abuse, is putting stuff in their minds that is actually, um, they're not prepared for, they're not mature enough for. And so any form of con talk of consent is wrong. And it's tragic when you look back at the 1960s revolutionaries, they were all in favor of abolishing the age of consent. And I've read this uh, best-selling new book out by Camille Kushner, uh, the, the family au grand, about the industrial levels of incest that were going on among those intellectuals in Paris in the 1960s to 70s. And it's utterly tragic. And the impact on the children was catastrophic and life-destroying. But that was the name of freedom. And of course, those adults kidded themselves that the kiddies were giving consent because they seemed to be complying and going along with it. Well, what were they supposed to do? These adults were in power over them. They admired them. They loved them. Shocking and horrific. It's a false trope. You know, if, if you've got two 12-year-olds dating or something and the 12-year-old thinks, well, I for a girl thinks, I really like him. He wants sex. Well, we like each other. Well, I consent. You know, she doesn't really understand what's going on at that age. It's a false trope. And then the really interesting thing with the Louise Perry book is that she goes on to extend that to, to, to women. And the whole outrage at the moment of the very casual sex culture, which involves degrees of domination and humiliation, and women being told they should be enjoying that. And then men thinking, well, that's the way to go. And then, are you saying yes to this? Yes, I'm saying yes to this. But women saying that because they think they're supposed to. And then ending up being degraded and damaged and harmed. And they sort of theoretically gave their consent. And then you get this very difficult situation that men are put into, that the women then might cry, oh, rape or whatever. But the men are looking perplexed and saying, well, I, I thought you were consenting. And it's all a complete mess. 
Mm. And, and it, it is. It's um, as a father of, of daughters, you know, some of the lines almost made me weep when you think of, you know, she says, girls, all they want to do is hold hands, but they're subjected to most um, gross and brutal acts choking. We don't, even want and, to talk and about. It, we don't want to talk about it, but but it's a very, very gritty book and it's not making stuff up. It's taking stuff from the real culture that's happening among kids in society today. And, and lots of people need to realise where we are to, to try and get us back to or forward or sideways wherever we need to get to but staying here is not an option absolutely it's a very eye-opening book uh, you know it's carrying on the theme of consent she gives graphic examples of um poor young women who have been effectively forced into the porn industry and yes they're giving their consent on one level they need the money they're whatever but but uh, and, and then they're pushed around saying oh well i'm doing this freely i'm doing this freely and then 30 is the magic age, which you're pretty well no good for that industry anymore. And then after that, how many of them come out and say, well, I was being I was being coerced into saying that I was consenting. Um, and she gives the, the the most obvious example of the star of, of Deep Throat, who said later, every time you watch that film, you are watching me being raped. And yet people are still watching that film. How outrageous is that? So, yeah, this 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 false trope of consent and this deceptive and dangerous trope is used to justify any form of degraded and humiliating behavior. It's used to justify porn. It's used to justify exploitation of children. And Louise Perry is, is kind of unpicking away in a very up-to-date way, just how much um, it can be exploited by the predatory and by the strong to actually manipulate um, and coerce. Yeah. And she makes the point that men and women are, they're not just different in terms of strength uh, on a population basis. Of course, you'll find some women who are stronger than some men. Um, but the strongest person, the most violent person is always a man. That's why the majority of the prison population, the vast majority is violent men, because men are more violent than women. Um, but then women and men also differ in traits. And, and this is something perhaps for a conversation another day, because we, society seems to be confusing the fact that traits and behaviours don't define your biological sex. There is a big overlap of maybe 30% in traits and behaviours between men and women. And just because your traits and behaviour, you may like pink or pretty colours, that doesn't make you a woman. It just means you like, if you're a man, pink and pretty colours. And that doesn't, and there's a whole trans discussion, which I think Louise sidesteps as well, and perhaps we should do today. But then she also makes the point that, well, of course, you know, men just want as much sex as they can get. Uh, a man can produce enough sperm in a day to fertilize thousands of women. A woman can produce one baby every nine months. And that fundamental biological difference affects absolutely everything about why man and woman behave the way they do and why they kind of need each other. Yes. Um, and I, I'd say to be fair to her, I think that because the book so clearly lays out biological reality in a sense that answers the trans issue and, and, and i think it makes the trans issue patently ridiculous when, when you see these absolute fundamental biological and also uh psychological differences so yeah but then on the issue of the differences she shows clearly that the marriage culture and the marriage contract which radical feminists made out to be this exploitative heteronormative system, which A, enforced heteronormativity as if it didn't exist, you know, but it enforced it, and B, kept women subservient because they were dependent on the financial support of their husband. And people like Jermaine Greer said, well, that's just, that's just mm. no better than prostitution. Uh, women get out of it. And I think that the strength of Louise Perry's book is that she shows no, that was all about actually protecting women because as soon as a woman is pregnant and when a young mother is nursing she is vulnerable and she does need support of some kind and frankly if it's not going to be the father of the child staying around to help and support her it will be the state but the state isn't actually such a satisfactory father for that baby um and so the uh, the much derided institution of marriage turns out to be really good for women rather than really 
bad for women. And you and I would always have known that, but it needs to be laid out in baby language for young women who have been sold this story that marriage is an evil patriarchal trap from which all women have to be liberated. And from somebody on the non-religious exactly. left as well. Exactly. So, and so it's quite good exactly. coming from her from that, exactly. from that perspective. It's, quite it's useful. got more traction yes, that's right. That's right. of who it's coming yeah. from. And she's a good writer. And she's also a very good, eloquent speaker. She's, yes. she's just a pleasure to listen to when she's Absolutely. talking about her book and Absolutely. other things. Yeah. So that, that's, yeah. that's great too. Yeah. Now, she does talk about monogamy, uh, which is quite interesting because... Uh, and, and this is this this is perhaps why I haven't asked her for an interview because in the book she says she supports same-sex marriage and it's just a throwaway line, you know how how wonderful it was that we had same-sex marriage, which kind of contradicts the benefits that she talks about marriage from my perspective because we know. Uh, first of all, there's very few people adopt same-sex marriage as we were speaking at the beginning. A tiny fraction of those who are who are homosexual. In, enter into a same-sex so-called marriage and of those who do the vast majority of um, uh, same-sex homosexual relationships are statistically typified by being sexually open it's not about monogamy hence the phrase love is love because it's not about you know <laughs> it's about who loves who not who has sex with who um, monogamously because that generally speaking isn't the case according to the stats and the research you know that you have this notion of um, however many sleepaways you get a month depending on how flexible your partner is and that sort of stuff which you don't normally get in a heterosexual marriage because heterosexual marriage I think it's Mark Regnerus yeah Mark Regnerus uh, who we spoke to recently raises this issue that um, marriage isn't about love marriage is because to any two people can love each other marriage is the thing that two people who love each other add to their love which only marriage can bring and it can only bring those things to a man and a woman because it's about this commitment to something bigger which is you know um, you're going to be vulnerable while you're having children i'm going to promise to stick around you know and she talks about women setting the price for sex and it used to be the case that you know, that the price for sex would be commitment, which she refers to as marriage, you know, and we seem to have lost that in society. Well, I think that it's more than that, Tony. I, I mean, that the chapter on marriage, she goes a long way towards outlining very well what you and I would believe is real marriage. In other words, it's bigger than the two people involved. It's not just about a personal relationship. It's not just about warm feelings towards somebody that, that that can come and go it's a building block for society and that these two people bring together these two families in in themselves to create a new family and that provides the context into which children are born knowing their genealogy on both sides so you've got this network between the generations so children know who their grandparents are they know who their aunties and uncles are they've got cousins they've got this network and there's that network of natural support um, and being an institution bigger than the two people involved, it involves norms. And that the, the, the rude word is rules. People don't like the word rules and, 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 and expectations. But the fact is there are obligations. And the number one obligation is fidelity, exclusivity. Um, it's, it's not just any old relationship that you can go in and to and go out of. There is this till death us do part. And that's so that those children know who their parents are and their parents commit to giving them care. And so... It has great benefits for the family, including the, mainly the children. It's there, from society's perspective, it's there to ensure that children are cared for. But it has great benefits for the family, but, but the wider society as well, if you've got this building block and these firm networks between, it's intergenerational care as well. We have a stronger feeling towards our grandparents than we have, might have a benevolent feeling towards the seniors in our community, but there's a stronger obligation towards our own grandparents and a stronger obligation to caring for our own parents when they get to old age, and so on and so forth. So she, she, she outlines the benefits of marriage as an institution, and she actually says, well, the old understanding of marriage was a conjugal union, which has to be um, man-woman, sexual complementarity, because only that union um, can reproduce. But then she, she says the new understanding is that marriage is just about a personal relationship. Yeah, that's true, but that's a wrong understanding. If it's just about a personal relationship, why not? Well, I mean, we, we go down the rabbit hole, any number, etc., etc., etc. 
And if it is just a personal relationship, she says, well, of course, we have to have gay marriage. And she is absolutely right, if that's all it is. Um, so, so she does this strange flip where she's described marriage as an institution bigger than the two people involved, a building block for society. There have to be um, rules and uh, obligations. And that's man, woman. That's the institution. Yeah. That's yeah. what we would call real marriage. Then she says, oh, but now people know that it's about love and commitment. And therefore, of course, gay people. And you and I look at each other and say, of course, there's love and commitment between these two people, because you would only ever make that death till, till death us do uh, part promise. Vol it's got to be voluntary as well, not forced to somebody that you love and are committed to. But it's not just any old love, any old relationship. It's that exclusive lifelong commitment. And so I think that it's I don't know, Tony, that 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 I found a bit contradictory and a little bit disappointing. I think she was, I don't know, who knows, but I think she was sidestepping the issue. I, I is, is my, because she spoke so powerfully about the, the essential nature of monogamy for society, which is just not characteristic of homosexual relationships. Well, the other thing uh, you noticed that she didn't actually comment on was the mm. implication for children. She didn't yeah, mention yeah. that as soon as you get yeah, so-called yeah. gay marriage, you are yeah. then saying that yeah. you have yeah. to allow yeah. children to be but, adopted. But she, she yeah. speaks about, I don't know if she did it in the book or if I've heard her in interviews, she speaks very strongly objecting to surrogacy, which is really interesting. Because? You know, t talking about yeah. separating a child from, from its, its mother. mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, so you, you just... You know, it's unnatural. You shouldn't do it. It's not. Right. So, you know, she she was channeling yeah, Katie yeah, Faust, yeah. you know, I mean, she was really going for it. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's amazing. Well, that's right. And I mean, I would, if any of your listeners haven't listened to that Katie Faust interview, please, please, please do. Because that interview so powerfully captures the cultural shift, whereby now everything is seen through the lens of adult rights. It's my right to purchase a child as if a child is a a, a piece of property it's outrageous it's like a new slavery and, and that interview with Katie Faust just shows that these um, artificial reproductive technologies often end up treating children as products and children are absolutely not products oh you are such a good advocate we're going to have to talk to you again <laughs> that's very good. but um she doesn't mention Unwin which is again another one I don't want to keep going on about yeah. interviews yeah. but we we had an interview yeah, about excellent. JD Unwin yeah. social yeah. anthropologist and he was another guy who actually spoke about the essential um how different cultures through time, uh, the ones that have survived, most of them were polygamous, yep? The natural state of, of man and woman is polygamy, sex whenever you want it. But the monogamous cultures are the ones that survived time. And as soon as they lost that monogamy, that's when they began to flounder. And she picks up on this. And, you know, she says without citing anyone, she talks about the fact that, you know, monogamous relationships are foundational. Um, and she also refers to the fact that, of course, the book's called The Sexual Revolution, but it's only one of the sexual revolutions that have taken place over time. And, you know, we would hope for another one that would perhaps restore some common sense to, to what's going on. Yeah, and, and that's the point. We should not be defeatist about this. And um, the really interesting shift in sexual norms to look at is the impact of Christianity in the West in the first three centuries after the death of Christ. And I find the um, writings of Rodney Stark fascinating. He's not a paid up, you know, card carrying paid up uh, confessional Christian, but his sociology shows very powerfully that one of the factors in the spread of early Christianity was the strict sexual ethic, which brought in a single sexual standard for men and women and that expectation of purity, and that elevated the, the dignity and position of women um, in a context in which women were utterly degraded and where there was an ocean of exploitation and suffering and where prostitution was rife and where free men could uh, exploit women, slaves, children, and all the rest of it. So into that ocean of exploitation, the Christian sexual ethic of a single standard and purity with, and, and fidelity and all the rest of it um, was extremely liberating for women, really liberating. And ultimately, actually, there was a pushback against prostitution and against sex trafficking and sex slavery and uh, an improved status of women. And I find it very ironic that since the sexual revolution, 
you've had the explosion of pornography and now globally people trafficking in the interests of that horrible vile business is the greatest one of the greatest human rights outrages today and again if you anyone really bothered about social justice should be worried about pornography and the trafficking that involves now she is good on pornography I'm very good on pornography, but the point I'm making is we do not have to be defeatist about um, a culture because cultures can change. And that that Christian ethic transformed um, sexual culture for the better. We've seen a great unraveling of that, but we shouldn't say that what we've got now is set in stone forever and ever and ever. That would be utterly defeatist. Mm-hmm. And a wise head on young shoulders, I think she's got, because, you know, she says we don't want to go back to this or that. And, you know, what, what we she she says, it's always a question of balance, a balance of freedom with responsibility. And, you know, she talks about uh, in one of the interviews, I think I heard she talks about seat belts, which we mentioned earlier on, you know, seat belts. You don't just wear a seat belt in a car to protect yourself, but you, you stop yourself from flying around the car and injuring other people in the event of a crash. And she's saying, well, actually, sexual promiscuity. You know, maybe we need to be teaching kids um, instead of how to have sex and all it needs is consent. And by the way, young children, here's all the different ways you can have sex as well, which is what we're doing these days, which is just mind-blowingly, ridiculously stupid. Um, but instead of doing that, perhaps we should teach restraints um, because restraints for yourself. Now, Pat Fagan, who we interviewed, the stats are very clear in terms of sexual partners before marriage and a direct link to the longevity of your marriage afterwards. You know, and if you've had, uh, you know, one sexual partner before the person you married, it fundamentally impacts your marriage and it's less likely to succeed. Yeah, she's good. She's good on the costs of casual sex. I think it damages both young women and, and young men, actually. It damages damages all of them. And it leads to disrespect for the body and a disrespect for the for the mind and the heart and the soul. And she is good on that. I think she could actually even make more of that because, um, you know, over, over years of pastoral work, I just saw the horrific harm um, when people looked back and they just felt used and betrayed and guilty. And I suppose I would have to say that she says what she says well. Um, and I think in a sense, her book will have more traction because she's not coming at from a faith perspective. But ultimately that leaves her book sadly with simply a kind of prescription to young people, don't watch porn, do get married if you can. Uh, but from, from, a, from a faith perspective, I would say, well, those of us who do have that have all of the, in, in a sense, the deeper, richer resources to say, but there is hope, there is healing, there is forgiveness and, and all of that and a new start. So, I mean, I, 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 would, I would love young people to, to hear her and listen to her, but then perhaps listen to more because i think she does struggle with that when when she's questioned on and i've listened to several interviews of her talking about this book now and when she's questions about so what do we do then louise she pulls a face because it's like i don't really know exactly you know, <laughs> you know it's all very well to tell young women get married mm. and stay married but many of them would love to mm. you see what i mean so mm. so so that's where advice goes so far but I think she'd be realistic and say well look you know I'm not going to solve the whole world's problems and, and she's not but she's done a, a good work and I would recommend um, anyone listening to buy the book read the book it is a bit of a gritty read so you've got to bear that in mind um, you know it's going to make you blush a little bit but that's real life it's good to and I would say you know you referred to to counsellors um, ministers pastors pastors wives you guys should definitely be reading this book because you probably don't know a lot about what's going on and you need to because it's happening uh you know we've got evidence from other people that we've interviewed that it's happening in the church as well as outside the church and i know we're we represent people of all faiths and none uh that includes outside the church and inside the church and it's happening all over the place and everywhere needs a bit of a change and a bit of a heal so yes and, and we we may object to reading this sort of stuff but let's be let's be absolutely realistic Sadly, tragically, many 12, 13 year olds out there are being exposed to precisely the sort of things she's describing. And we need to be there to help them. And we need to be there as a lighthouse and say, look, there is a bit better way. You don't have to get trapped in this for the rest of your life. Um, so I think we do, we do need to know what's going on.
Now, can I, um, can I just um, segue a little bit into what you've been working on, what you're doing, because we know and love the work which is up on our YouTube channel. Let me, let me tell everyone, if you're looking at this video now, just scroll down the, the videos that we've got and go back in time for some of, some of the ones that Sharon put up there. Wonderful arguments and evidence in support of real marriage. Uh, and also a little bit of an advert and a plug. If you want us to come and talk to you about evidence and arguments in support of marriage, we offer free presentations, no charge, anywhere in the UK. Just get in touch, admin at c4m.org.uk. We'll arrange a date, we'll come and talk to you about uh, evidence and arguments, the legal side of your rights to speak up for marriage. And, you know, let's try and make the difference, which is not just an ideological, it's my preference. This is what builds good society. And we're not saying that other people can't do other things, but we're saying, this is the thing that needs promoting. So plug out the way. Tell us a bit more about what you're working on, what you've been doing recently. Well, for the past eight or so years, I've been working for the Christian Institute. One of the things that the Christian Institute does is campaign for freedom of speech, including for those who do believe in real marriage, man-woman marriage. Um, I, I'm sure that you are all familiar with the Ashes case that the Christian Institute took on and won. Um, so simply saying that people should not be compelled to say that they don't agree with real marriage. So I work for the Christian Institute. I also do a, a fair bit of writing. Uh, my books are all up on Amazon if you want to take a look. So I've written a book about gender ideology and particularly the damage that that does to children and young people and the need to protect children and young people. Um, I've done a book more for, for a Christian audience from um, God's Design for Women, which outlines many of the betrayals of radical feminism, third wave feminism, fourth wave feminism. Um, a book, The Lies We Are Told, The Truth We Must Hold, outlines the damage of the sexual revolution um, mm. and the way... And that's that just published very recently, wasn't fairly it? Fairly recently, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's a very, very good book. Yeah. Well a new, worth a, a read. A new little book for students, making some of that book even more accessible and simple. Um, and, and, and a book that your readers might be interested in is a book called How Christianity Transformed the World, because it's very much picking up that theme that in terms of justice issues and dignity of women issues and protection of life issues... Christianity had a transformative and positive effect in the world, and yet so often it's now presented in such a negative light. Um, but we need well, to. That, that's look at the that's really elements. good because there's there's a, and whether you're you know a Christian or not, it's quite interesting. I know Tom Holland wrote a very big tome, Dominion, yeah. which was impenetrably large for a lot of people. Sadly, it was yeah. like six hundred pages. A lot of people just won't read that. But sure. yours is a lot shorter. Well, and more I mean, succinct, I really appreciate so. Tom Holland's work, and yeah. I really appreciate the work yeah, of, yeah. of many others who've written yeah. also quite academic yeah. works. I aim to yeah. make things short and simple. So yeah. you can read them in fairly short chapters, in fairly short bites. Uh, you you do journey. that very, very well. And can I recommend everyone just pop onto Amazon, look up Sharon's books and just buy them all and read them all. It's fantastic. Um, what, what's on the horizon for you? What are you uh, hoping to work on? Oh, Tony, I won't even go into the long list. Uh, there's, there's, <laughs> there's so much. But um, but yeah, I mean, I want to keep my, my passion is child protection and protecting young people from some of the toxic fallout of these ideologies. I just find it absolutely heartbreaking that by age 14, 15, some of these kids have seen stuff, done stuff, damaged themselves um, in ways that would have been incomprehensible 50, 60 years ago. Uh, so and you can't undo it. You can't go backwards. You can't so make it not free, happen. So-called yeah. freedom. Yeah. You know, it leads to an anarchy and chaos. So the heart and soul of a lot of what I'm doing is simply trying to expose the bad ideas and say bad ideas bear bitter fruit in the lives of real people. Um, we need to go back to truth and we need to see young people understanding that they can say no to some of the really dangerous and bad and toxic ideas out there. Um, I do have hope, Tony, because I do see a younger generation coming up who really do want to know the truth and who believe there is such a thing as truth. And when they're told in their university classrooms, oh, there's no such thing as truth, they're seeing through that. Um, so I'm, I'm not pessimistic and I'm not defeatist. And I think you're, you're right. Uh, Louise Perry talks about a swing of the pendulum. Uh, and, and really, I think what you're doing is so valuable, Sharon, because as that pendulum swings, people want to read succinct material about why they feel the way they do to help them articulate the way forward. And your stuff does that. Truth is truth. And young people resonate with that. I mean, the poet Horace, a pagan poet, said so wisely you know you can you can chuck nature out with a pitchfork but she'll always come hurrying back you can't kick down the mountains truth is truth 
and, and people will come back to it. Yeah, well, and, and that's the hope for marriage as well. You know, it is the natural desire of the vast majority of people to find a mate for life yeah. and dedicate to each other. And there's just something innate in us that does that. And the thing is that strong marriage is good for everyone. And many people are not married, but we all have, you know, we come from a family of some kind and we are blessed if we come from a, from a family where there was a stable mum and a dad. And if we didn't have that ourselves, very often we're the ones who would say, well, that's what we would like other people to enjoy. And we would like society to have a, a marriage friendly atmosphere rather than one that freezes out all the poor people at the bottom and only allows the rich top class to enjoy it. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point to end. I mean, everyone here listening comes from a mum and a dad and that ain't changing anytime soon. So Sharon James, thank you very much for your time. Uh, all the best in, in your work going forward. And uh, hopefully we'll speak to you again. Great to talk to you, Tony. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.